Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to iSelect's Deep Dive webinar series. My name is Tom Bunn. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to walk you through today's discussion uh, with a number of exceptional researchers and entrepreneurs in their respective fields. Um, so for those of you new to these webinars, iSelect Fund is an early stage venture capital firm in St. Louis, Missouri, focused primarily on early stage companies in food, agriculture, and health. I select invest at the forefront of innovation, seeing emerging problems, solutions, and technologies in and at their infancy. And we use these deep dive presentations not only as a way for us to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but also to engage with the experts and entrepreneurs who are driving change and innovation in their respective fields. So one theme that we have been researching um, for a couple of years now is the biology of aging and longevity. As many of you may know, over the last few decades, major breakthroughs in our understanding and our ability to understand with um, you know, platform technologies such as gene sequencing have allowed us to better understand aging and its implications for, for disease. Um, these, these have emerged again over the last few decades. And with these breakthroughs, we're on the verge of potentially increasing and extending our healthy years of life with fewer uh, morbidities at the late stage of, of someone's life and, and more life at the end of someone's life. So for these reasons and others, which we will cover in today's webinar, aging and longevity is of increasing interest to iSelect, uh, where a lot of interesting technologies and, and research is, is happening um, all over the world. So a few process comments. We are not soliciting investment or giving investment advice in any way whatsoever. This presentation is general industry research based on publicly available information. Secondly, we have invited you to this because you are technologists, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, industry experts, early adopters, uh, or sophisticated investors that are part of our network. We value your thoughts, questions, comments, and insights into this topic, and would appreciate it if you engage during the presentation. We will have some time for Q&A at the end, uh, but if you uh, feel moved to do so, please raise your hand or type in a question during, during the call, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So with that, I'm pleased to bring you this week's deep dive on aging and longevity. So just uh, a couple notes on what, what we're gonna do today. I'll give brief speaker introductions. I'll give a brief background on aging, um, but I will really let the bulk of this conversation be driven by our phenomenal guest this morning. Um, and hopefully there'll be some cross-pollination among them as well and uh, among our audience as well. Uh, finally, we will have some time for discussion. I have some further prompts, but of course, if there are questions that arise from the audience, um, that'd be terrific. So a big thank you to our guests. Um, we have quite the, quite the guest list here today. Uh, on the left, going in alphabetical order, uh, Dr. Thomas Pearls. Uh, Dr. Pearls is among the international leaders in the field of human exceptional longevity. He is founder and director of the New England Centenarian Study, the largest study of centenarians and their families in the world. He is also a principal investigator of the NIA-funded Long Life Family Study and a professor of medicine and geriatrics at BU School of Medicine. Dr. Pearls, thanks so much for joining us today. Secondly, we have Dr. Chris Rhodes. Uh, Chris is the CEO of Davis California Startup Innate Biology, which is developing fasting memetics. We'll dive into what, what that means um, and the implications of fasting on longevity and health um, throughout the presentation. Chris earned his PhD in nutritional biochemistry from UC Davis. Finally, Dr. Brianna Stubbs. Uh, Brianna completed her PhD in metabolic biochemistry at Oxford University. She also became a world champion rower as part of the Great Britain Rowing Lightweight Women's Four-Person Crew and won three other World Rowing Championship medals. She has published, published peer-reviewed studies looking at ketone metabolism, ketone ester supplementation in athletes, and effects of ketones on appetite. She is now lead trans translational scientist at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging, where she works with a lab whose focus is ketones and the elderly for healthy aging. Uh, the Buck mission statement is quite apropos. It's to extend the healthy years of life, um, which I think we can all agree is a, is a noble goal. So getting into a little bit of background, just to set the stage for our, our, 
participants and guests. Um, aging and longevity, a few key concepts. Um, so Darrow Science and Longevity's research aims is really to prevent and delay age-related diseases, as I've shown here with uh, the acronym ARD, and to increase health span. So if you look at the, the right-hand side, upper right-hand side of the screen, this is a, a graphical representation of what that really means. So on the top is kind of present day normal aging. Uh, you have a decently long, healthy life. Uh, and then you um, reach a point where you have some sort of chronic age-related disease, are in a period of morbidity for uh, a fairly long amount of time, and then you die. Um, the, the goal of, again, this longevity research is to optimize the amount of time that one is healthy before, before dying and also uh, potentially optimizing or increasing the lifespan as well. So health span is, is the healthy years of your life. Lifespan obviously is the, the years of your life. Uh, but the goal here is to improve the healthy years of your life. Um, researchers are increasingly contending that the aging process itself is behind many, many of these age-related diseases. So think of the, the most common ways people die, be they cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's. Um, upstream of those, of those disease indications, researchers, again, are increasingly finding that um, the aging process itself is, is really to blame there, um, and that we can and should treat aging as a disease. Um, at least many researchers feel that way. I'm sure there are many uh, who don't as well. Um, so researchers, again, as I mentioned over the last few decades, they're exploring many lifestyle and clinical inter interventions that show great promise in extending health span and delaying uh, age-related diseases. And you can see just a smattering of, of them on the bottom right here. Um, you know, they, they range from healthy lifestyle choices to more uh, clinical derived interventions. So on the healthy lifestyle front, you know, caloric restriction and fasting, which we'll get into um, uh, down the road in this presentation, slight nuance, slight difference there uh, between caloric restriction and fasting, fasting more about um, the interval of time between calorie intake as opposed to strict caloric re re reduction. And then uh, high, in, high intensity interval training uh, from another lifestyle point of view is, um, has shown a great promise in, in terms of uh, turning on some of the genetic markers and, and um, uh, bolstering the defenses at a, at a cellular and genetic level. Then in the areas in the clinic, some, you know, some popular um, or some promising rather uh, approaches that are being explored. Um, one is in the, the field of senolytics. Um, Senolytics is a field that uh, is trying to clear senescent cells. Senescent cells are uh, what's called, what are often called zombie cells um, that uh, collect. They aren't dividing, but they aren't quite dead. Um, and they are responsible for a lot of inflammation. They kind of hang around and cause problems. And uh, many think they're, um, you know, to blame in, in many of the chronic diseases we face, particularly as people get older. Repurpose drugs. Uh, there's very interesting research coming out about, you know, metformin, for instance, which is being uh, trialed for um, delaying the onset of many age-related diseases, such as dementia, heart disease, and cancer. Um, it's shown promise in, uh, in mouse models. Um, but of course, metformin is only uh, prescribed to people with diabetes at this point. Um, and again, this gets back to the point that currently aging is not considered a disease. Um, and then, of course, genetics. So genetics, a uh, good jumping off point for Dr. Thomas Pearls, um, is uh, foundational to a lot of these, these research areas. Um, so I'll hand it over to Dr. Pearls to discuss his work on the genetic uh, components of centenarians. Thanks Dr. very Pearls. much. Yep. Thanks very much, uh, Tom. It's very nice to be with all of you. Uh, my aim here is to probably talk for about 15 minutes and leave uh, five or 10 minutes for people to ask questions, please. I'm in the middle of a big steering committee <laughs> meeting that's lasting all day. So I just dropped out for a bit of time so that I can be with you all. And then I have to jump back to that meeting. So um, uh, what's special about centenarians? Uh, they're very rare. They're about one per 5,000 generally in the population. Um, uh, 
And for people who are around 100 or 101, it is one per 5,000. But as you get to older ages, obviously, they're much rarer. Uh, 105 year olds to about 109, we uh, are what we call semi supercentenarians, and they're about one per 250,000 of the population. And 110 plus year olds are what we call supercentenarians, or one per 5 million. Next slide. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, go back one, Tom, thanks. Uh, there, just to show you our oldest subject ever, interestingly, was uh, Sarah Knaus, who we knew back in the late 90s. She was, uh, was 119, the second oldest person ever. This is a picture of her with her great, great, great grandson. Next, next please. So it's important to know that um, you can't just group uh, the why people why these in, uh, centenarians are interesting um, just to age a hundred plus. Turns out that um, people say who are 105 and older, who as I said are so much rarer, um, are a very different phenotype. Um, than say people who are 100 and they in turn are quite different than people who are 110. And let me explain. So about 90% of centenarians are disability free up through their early 90s. And, and they speak to this uh, idea of the older you get, the healthier you've been, as opposed to what people have said in the past of the older you get, the sicker you get. And 15% of these people living to 100 are what we call escapers, or those who have no really appreciable age-related disease at the age of 100, no dementia, cancer, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and so on. Now, on the other hand, people who are living to 110, 70% of those individuals were escapers at the age of 100. And they live independently up to about age 106. These are truly our creme de la creme folks. Next slide. So, you know, living to 100 is uh, quite a heterogeneous phenotype, uh, phenotype meaning clinical characteristics. So that I would say about, um, 45% or so of centenarians are what we call survivors or people who have age-relating diseases before the age of 85. Another uh, 40, 45% are these um, delayers or people who have, who have delayed age-related disease beyond the age of 85. And then we have those escapers that I mentioned. Um, now, when you hear that, you know, uh, 40, you know, 90% have had age-related diseases before the age of 85. You might say, well, what's so good about that? Remember that over 90% of them are living independently uh, up through their early 90s. So they're really quite resilient, even if they may have age-related diseases. They're quite resilient, dealing with these diseases much better than others and living with them rather than dying of them. Um, on the other hand, We've got these folks living to 110 who are not only delaying age-related diseases, they're also delaying, um, I'm sorry, delaying uh, age-related uh, disability uh, or aging-related diseases, uh, uh, the disability from those things. But at, if you're living to 110, you're delaying not only disability, but also diseases. And they fit this idea of Jim Fries, a, a scientist um, who I think is, was at UC Davis, Chris, um, who came up with this notion of compression of morbidity, that as you approach the limits of lifespan, you also have to compress the time that you're sick towards the end of your life, especially diseases associated with mortality. And that's what we're seeing with the 110 plus group. And as a result, they're also very homogeneous. Unlike the earlier groups that are quite a heterogeneous group, this group is quite alike in terms of their clinical characteristics. And so one has to uh, suppose that they must have some pretty special characteristics in common that enable that homogeneity. 
And what we have found is that while 75% or so of average aging is probably your behaviors, the difference between people according their, to their health-related behaviors, um, if you're smoking and overweight and a couch potato, it makes sense that on average, those individuals are going to die in their late 60s and their 70s. If you're doing everything right, like the Seventh-day Adventist with uh, a, a diet conducive to a healthy weight, not smoking, not drinking, being vegetarian, managing your stress well, uh, you're going to live on average like a Seventh-day Adventist to about 86 if you're a man and 89 if you're a woman. So the vast majority, uh, and I would say that's very optimistic to say, and I think realistic that humans have what it takes to get to 90. They just need to do everything right from a behavior point of view. So the vast majority of the variation of living to age 90 is going to be your health behaviors. On the other hand, to get to 110, we've discovered genetic signatures that uh, which are combinations of genes that uh, explain about 75% of the variation living to 110. So the tables are turned in terms of, of uh, the role of genes at these most extreme ages. Because they're so alike, we think that we don't need such a big sample size to make these kind of discoveries of what they have in common, more along the line of 500 to 1,000 individuals at these most extreme ages, as opposed to what we normally want to see in these kind of genetic studies of complex diseases, which requires tens of thousands of individuals. The other important thing to note is that these centenarians have uh, similar frequencies of disease-associated genes as the general population. So what's probably really making the difference is protective genes, which is also a very optimistic point of view, thinking that we're going to discover genes that slow down aging and decrease your risk for aging-related diseases. And it, perhaps trans, if they're protective, maybe we could translate that protection into some kind of medicine or, um, or uh, other uh, strategies. Next slide, please. Quick, quick question here, uh, Dr. Pearls. On, on, the more, uh, on the compressing of morbidity point you mentioned, do you have... Um, you know, quantifiable data on that on that front. I'm interested in in that. I, I was reading a report last night around the average time at onset for, <clears throat> excuse me, for an age related disease in the U.S. is about 63, with that lifespan being 79. So roughly 13 years uh, or 16 years of uh, of um, you know morbidity prior to death. Have you what what is the ballpark range of that compression what, that you're seeing for these folks? Yeah, so, so for centenarians, um, the big deal for people living to about 100, 101, which is the vast, vast majority of centenarians, um, it's not um, the uh, compression of morbidity or diseases, as Jim Fries indicated, it's the compression of disability. Now, I would say, if you have to have these diseases, being able to compress the time that you're experiencing disability into the last five to seven years of your life, a very, very long life is what most of us would want. But then when you really do start approaching the true limits of human lifespan, as Jim Fries posited, then you are delaying both disability and disease into the last three or four years of your life, uh, living to 110. So it's a really, really small proportion of, of one's life at these most extreme ages. Got it, thank you. Okay, next slide. So uh, wh uh, where are we now? Well, um, there's a space there between these uh, three studies that we'll get to in a moment to describe a really new exciting grant that we have. But uh, I'm the principal investigator of these three studies, the Integrative Longevity Omics Study, a set, the centenarian project of a group of studies called the Longevity Consortium and the Long Life Family Study. Um, go ahead and click the button there, uh, Tom. We just got a grant hot off the press uh, that starts uh, in two days called uh, RADCO, which is Resilience and Resistance Against Alzheimer's Disease in Centenarians and Offspring. 
Um, up to this point, we've enrolled about 2,500 centenarians or siblings and their offspring. Um, these studies, all of them together, will boost that up to about 4,500 subjects um, in about a year or so. Um, we have a pretty large group of research assistants at this point, um, both at Boston University and Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, uh, we were greatly delayed by COVID, but now we're up and running again in terms of recruitment and enrollment. Um, for RADCO, we're really uh, doing the creme de la creme. We're going to study the centenarians that have been enrolled in these other studies who have the cognitive function of people 30 years younger in their 70s. And um, doing a whole range of blood-borne bio, uh, blood biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease, doing MRIs, as well as doing post-mortem uh, brain autopsies to gauge the individuals who have resilience, that is, they have evidence of Alzheimer's disease by these markers, but they didn't have any clinical evidence of it. And those who were resistant, those who have just no evidence of Alzheimer's disease at these extreme ages. And um, and then down the road, um, start doing some real wonderful basic biology led by Rudy Tanzi and his group at Mass General, um, doing uh, uh, using inter, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells and derived neurons, putting that in their Alzheimer's disease, disease in a dish model and using these neurons basically from supercentenarians um, and understanding in that model uh, what the actual biological mechanisms that seem to be conferring resistance to, or even, uh, or, or resilience to Alzheimer's disease. I kind of put the cart before the horse there. I just want to, in terms of all the data and biological samples that we're collecting, but is very detailed and careful cognitive function um, we use an actigraph watch to measure physical and sleep uh, functional data. We do very careful and um, expanded family pedigree pedigrees. We get medical and dental history, dietary habits, um, and the brain MRIs for RADCO uh, across four different cities. Um, and then biological samples uh, include blood, fecal samples. We're very, very interested in microbiome, particularly in the kids who are in their 70s and 80s and doing terrifically well. Um, we're establishing these induced by, uh, pluripotent stem cell lines. We already have about uh, 10 of the from supercentenarians actually. Um, and uh, we get brain donations um, so that we can do uh, gene expression studies from particular areas of the brain that are uh, led by uh, Winston Hyde at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and of course, doing the um, brain autopsies. And I think that's it for our uh, my slides. Is that right, Tom? Oh, okay. So just, uh, I've already been through each of yeah. these. Um, and so I think that's it. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy you mentioned epigenetic studies that are on the precipice of, of beginning. You know, one of my questions was around, you know, a lot of what Dr. Stubbs and Dr. Rhodes will be talking about is, is kind of the epigenetic switches that may turn on from lifestyle factors such as fasting, caloric restriction. Is there any way you can back into that to um, kind of retrospectively examine some of those decisions these centenarians have made? and, and in, uh, well, in their uh, lives or? Our, our retroscope, which is actually prospective, is looking at the kids who have half the rates of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer compared to other people born the same time, say around the same time. Now, a good bunch of that could be behavioral, you know, that they don't smoke, that they don't drink. Maybe they've been hit, maybe they have some really good health related behaviors, which can be quite common in these families. Um, but again, we think that there's a pretty strong genetic component as well. We can follow these people over time um, through the longevity omic study, uh, which we get quite a large amount of money from the NIA um, 
to do a slew of omics. So that includes methylomics. So we can start looking at uh, the epigenetics um, as well as transcriptomics. Uh, the other omics that we're doing is proteomics and, and also, as I had mentioned before, the, the microbiome. And uh, through a collaboration with um, Regeneron, actually, we're also doing a uh, whole exome sequencing. And then soon through the NIH, we'll be doing whole genome sequencing. And I wanna mention that all these data are gonna be freely available within nine months of their generation on a web portal called the Exceptional Longevity um, Translation uh, web portal called Elite that is sponsored by the National Institute on Aging. And the pluripotent stem cells and the derived lines, including the, the cortical neurons, um, will be available through our regenerative medicine um, institute at uh, Boston Medical Center, Boston University. So all of these things will be freely available to academia as well as um, uh, industry. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Pearls, thanks so much for, for taking the time. I know you're tight on time. Um, we really appreciate you joining us and uh, hope to speak with you very soon. Yeah, I'm sorry I can't stick around. I'd love to hear Chris and Brianna's talks. Um, I have to run back to the this big steering committee meeting. And thanks, everybody. No problem. We'll, we'll send you a uh, recording. Oh, good. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks. Take care. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Brianna Stubbs. Um, as a rejoinder to my uh, introduction of to her, of her earlier, I just wanted to say that she's um, also a advisor for iSelect uh, company Readout, um, which is doing the uh, breath analysis of of ketones, um, which is how we got connected. So um, missed that up front, but I just wanted wanted to highlight that. Um, Dr. Stubbs, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing? Um, I know many people on the on the line are probably familiar with with ketones, uh, but perhaps start somewhat at the, uh, at the beginning and, and uh, would love to hear kind of your uh, focus. Good morning. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, so I think it is helpful to provide a little bit of background and context. The number of people I speak to have heard about ketones only in the con context of the ketogenic diet. And so one of the things that people think about first when they think about keto or ketones is, is weight loss. So kind of going to backtrack all the way back to the, the basic biology to unpack that so we can understand a little bit more about the full potential of ketone biology that really extends uh, beyond just weight loss. So um, you can see on the bottom left, those chemical structures there are the three ketone bodies that our body will make naturally. Acetone is the one that is in the breast and that is the one that the biosense uh, readout analyzer is detecting. Uh, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate are the two ketones that circulate in the blood. And you can see here, they're very, very small, simple molecules. And they're kind of like a way that our body will take a complex fat molecule and break it down so that it's more readily available to be a fuel for, um, particularly in the brain, uh, because fat's not very easy for the brain to use as fuel. The brain normally uh, depends almost completely on glucose and other small molecules like lactate. And so you know, the evolutionary purpose of ketones is that when we are not able to eat enough carbohydrate in our diet, uh, the brain starts to be a bit of a, um, a worry in terms of providing enough fuel. We all have uh, quite limited carbohydrate stores in our body. It uh, traps a lot of water. It's very sort of uh, inefficient to store, but we all have a lot of fat. It's very efficient to store energy as fat. And so evolutionarily, the uh, conversion of fat into ketones serves the purpose of providing this small, easy to, to break down energy for the brain in times of starvation. And so um, ketones aren't just used in the brain. The heart is an avid user of ketone bodies as well. Skeletal muscle a little as well. Really every um, tissue in the body can use ketones apart from the liver, which is where they're made. Um, so really up until the 60s, um, we really focused on the roles of ketones as a fuel. And it's been in the last sort of 15 years or so that we've started to understand that 
more than just being an energy substrate to, to power our mitochondria, that ketones can actually bind directly with proteins uh, more like a drug and have these signaling effects that uh, trigger a lot of helpful biological processes and intersect with a number of the hallmarks of aging. So if you look now to the bottom right, um, this slide is sort of giving you an overview that I'm sure we'll hear about from our next speaker that caloric restriction and fasting are very, very reliable ways to extend lifespan in multiple model organisms from yeast, mice, um, and then obviously famous studies with rhesus monkeys. Um, really, we, our hypothesis is that ketone bodies play a role and the production and metabolism of ketone bodies plays a role in this uh, extension of lifespan and of health span that we see. Um, some work that came out of both the Buck and UC Davis, two independent papers published in the same uh, edition of Cell Metabolism, showed that ketogenic diets in mice uh, were able to extend lifespan and health span. So um, improving cognitive function and physical function in these mice, as well as extending their lifespan. Um, and so a lot of my work now focuses uh, on using uh, supplemental ketones. So taking, uh, separating out ketogenic diet from just the presence of ketones to try and understand exactly how much of a contribution that the ketones themselves make to these lifespan and health span uh, effects that we see. Uh, next slide. I have one. So um, the two most promising, in my view, applications for ketone biology and aging and, and those where the area, uh, the research is most advanced are in the brain and the heart. So I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an overview of, of that mechanism uh, for that and also where the research is today. So um, as I was mentioning in the introduction a second ago, uh, keto, one of the main purposes of ketone body production is to provide a uh, fuel source for the brain. And one thing that we see in the aging brain, uh, especially in people who go on to develop neurodegenerative disorders, is that their brain's ability to metabolize glucose is compromised. And, and interestingly, you can often see this years and years and years before people uh, display any symptoms of the disease. If you put them in a scanner and use um, FDG PET type imaging to look at glucose metabolism in the brain. So really, we actually don't know whether this decline in glucose metabolism is the chicken or the egg, because if the brain is energy starved, it's more likely that more damage is going to occur, and that's probably going to speed the progress of, of the disease. Um, so what we have found in animal models and now up through into human models is that these people's brains um, still can metabolize ketones very efficiently. And if we are able to use supplemental ketones, just... Um, so, for example, ketogenic fat drinks, and now people are looking at ketone esters and ketone salts. So all of these are different levels of potency of a ketone supplement or a ketone food. So if we just give all we have to change with people is give them these supplements and we can see there's a rescue in their brain energy metabolism. Their brain is less energy starved. But also, interestingly, in a six month study of these ketogenic drinks, they were also able to detect cognitive improvements and decline in cognitive decline as it were, a reduction in cognitive decline in patients who had mild cognitive impairment. So this is um, an area that I'm watching very closely and excited to see uh, more research coming out as big companies like Nestle and whatnot start to get involved making food products that are based on ketone bodies. Thank you. Uh, and another area which, which we are actually actively looking into at the moment is how ketone bodies can affect the failing heart. And somewhat similar to the brain, uh, the failing heart has very dysregulated energy metabolism, inability to switch between glucose and fats. And, and really um, that is one of the things that drives cardiac remodeling. The heart gets less able to pump. Um, interestingly, now we're, we're seeing a recognition that one whole subset of heart failure patients it's really a metabolic disease that involves their skeletal muscle and many other tissues in the periphery, and it's not just the heart. So we're starting to learn that heart failure is, is a whole body syndrome. And so actually, again, being able to uh, rescue these multiple metabolic contributors as well as provide energy to the heart um, 
is is a important and um, multi layered approach, let's just say to treating these diseases. So not only are ketones able to provide energy to the heart, but through their signaling roles, they're able to uh, change epigenetic expression of oxidative stress defenses. Ketones also can regulate components of the innate immune system. Um, and really the list goes on. Uh, this is very well researched in, oh, back one for me, not quite finished yet. Uh, just wanted to give an overview of where the research is. So a um, number of studies using animals that have shown that both the ketogenic diet and ketone supplements are able to improve, improve cardiac function. So as you see, I've listed here mice, rats, dogs, and then interestingly, when humans as well are at the stage, the graph you can see on the right, uh, is patients who have heart failure being given an intravenous infusion of ketone bodies. Uh, the box circled on the left is the cardiac output me measures. So we see acute improvements of cardiac output in the order of about 20%, I believe. And then the box that's sort of going down that's on the right, that systemic vascular resistance. So it seems that ketones can even very acutely change some of these markers of heart function in patients who have heart disease. Now we can so, go to the next Dr. Stubbs, just a quick question there. So in, in a presentation I heard you give, you, you stated you know, that, that hearts relative to other organs are um, you know, metabolically omnivorous, I think, I think you use it. So is this, is this relatively new, new science here? Um, the fact that, that some fuel sources are perhaps better or um, trying to connect the dots there. Yeah, I mean, I really, really don't like describing any fuel sources better because people are often right. like trying to look to be like, oh, well, ketones are the superior fuel. I think what we actually see is that in disease, the ability to use regular fuels is compromised. So being right. able to fuel organs through alternative pathways is the best alternative. You know, the, the substrate selection, our heart isn't sentient. It choosing its fuel dependent on the amount of oxygen available, the amount of fuel available, and its its output needs. And you know, it, it's easy for us to conceptualize when we think about skeletal muscle. When we're sitting at rest or doing very low intensity exercise, it's great for our skeletal muscle to burn fat. But when we're doing those all out sprints, then our, we have to burn carbohydrates. So you know, there's there's no one fuel that no one fuel to rule them all, as it were. But I think that the key breakthrough that's been made with ketone research in the heart is that <clears throat> firstly we discovered that it was upregulated uh, and then we discovered that it was adaptive and if you knocked it out or, or, or dampened the ability to do ketone oxidation in these failing hearts then the outcomes were worse so um, that's been the progression up to this point because when that first discovery of oh well a failing heart oxidizes more ketones once that was discovered people didn't know whether that was a good or a bad thing um, but what we have actually seen is that it, it is adaptive in mo many of these animal models. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so really just to wrap up, um, I'm not going to go through all of the detailed mechanisms that we know have identified that ketones act as a signal. But if you're interested in understanding how ketones go above and beyond just being a uh, starvation metabolite and a really a signaling metabolite, I'd really encourage you to go away and look at the work of uh, my academic mentors at the book, John Newman and Eric Verdon. They really pull together this review, which is like the Bible. But um, you can see on the right here, just to give you an overview, we have ketones interacting with the NLRP3 inflammasome. So that's the component of the innate immune system. We have ketones uh, affecting epigenetic changes through both directly becoming uh, bound to histones themselves in a modification that's called BHV elation, which is a novel mod uh, modification only discovered in the last couple of years. Um, histone, uh, BHV affects histone uh, acetylation, deacetylation, because their histone deacetylase inhibitors, sorry, it's a bit of a double negative, I always get a bit tied up there, but that affects expression of longevity related genes. Um, Recently, also very interestingly discovered that ketones can have an effect on senescence, um, but then ketones also have direct receptor binding effects as well uh, on these surface receptors, HCAR2 and FFAR3, and that affects sympathetic, parasympathetic balance, but also interestingly, other the availability of other fuels for lipolysis. So really, um, it's been 
a fantastic time to be part of this field as all of this research has been coming out. If we had drawn this figure, I mean, I'm, I just turned 30, I've been researching these molecules now for about nine years, but if we had drawn this diagram when I started in the field, there has maybe only been like one or two elements on it. So, you know, it's quite exciting to be seeing every year, every few years, new binding partners for ketones being identified. And, and some of that work we are doing at the Buck and uh, we have some papers that will be coming out soon. They'll hopefully add to this list. And um, what I do there is really working to develop these ketone supplements and understanding them in, in animal and human models. So that really what we wanna do is take this science um, and understand the implications for the humans. And I hope that in my career, we'll be able to see um, drugs that are based on this ketone body biology. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Stubbs. Um, we'll, we'll circle around for some questions that have come up at the end here, but um, I'd like to get to Dr. Rhodes here. Um, I think it's a great segue talking about uh, fasting metabolites. Um, it, which is what innate biology is, is studying. So uh, doc, Dr. Rhodes, can you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and, and uh, the, the company you founded? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so thank you, Brianna. Uh, she's totally right. Uh, she and I have a lot of the same problem. Um, people always consider fasting, especially now that it's become so popular as like a weight loss intervention and like sometimes miss the nuances of like all the great things that fasting can actually do for you. Um, so a little bit about me. I got my um, bachelor's of science in biochemistry from Louisville Marymount University. Um, got out, didn't really know what I wanted to do, like a lot of undergrads. Um, did a two year stint at an immunology fellowship at Stanford where I really got into longevity research, anti-aging research. And of course, when you're in that realm, you eventually come across fasting because as we've talked about a little bit today, it's one of the few mechanisms that we know of to reliably extend um, lifespan, but then also health span as well. So it has this profound effect on almost every major disease, whether it's you know neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular diseases, you know autoimmune diseases. Fasting can kind of help with all of these um, various um, like negative health outcomes. And what's really interesting about it is that it does so without actually adding anything to the system, right? It's not some magic elixir or some novel exotic plant extract, right? It's just triggering your own body's natural mechanisms for these regenerative and protective processes. Um, so that was really, really interesting to me. I thought that that was so cool. I wanted to try it out myself and I did it using my immunology. I did some like alternate day fasting and started testing my own samples using my immunology background and found that it was even in me, a young, healthy person, this like profoundly anti-inflammatory um, intervention. So it could, you know, increase the anti-inflammatory effect of my blood and then also um, like modify my macrophage polarization around my T and B cell repertoires in a really sensitive time frame. So that's what kind of got me really into fasting. I could see it actually working in myself. And that's what I brought to UC Davis. Um, I was really interested in studying not only fasting, but human fasting, because that was something that was kind of missing in the field. There were a lot of mice studies, but not a lot of human studies. And what I set out to do, basically, and what eventually spun out into innate biology, um, was kind of decoding this innate regenerative bio program of fasting and trying to figure out if there was a way that we could actually recreate it to get the benefits of fasting without, you know, all of the downsides of fasting, right? Without having to actually do the thing, because that's pretty hard to do, especially in the long term. Um, so at Innate Biology, what we are doing is basically using human fasting as a roadmap for the development of these, you know, clinically derived longevity and health span molecules and developing um, this combination fasting mimetic. Um, and how we're doing this is essentially by supplementing people with the same beneficial molecules that their body naturally produces during a prolonged 36 hour fast you know, we can kind of recreate that physiological state of fasting. And by doing that, kind of get the same benefits of fasting without actually having to fast. Um, so what we, what we have up here um, is basically how we discovered the platform. And this was basically my PhD work. Um, so what we did was we took 20 healthy young men and women, 10 men and 10 women to try and avoid a gender bias and get complete information. 
And we had them come in either a baseline state, a typical overnight fasted state, or a prolonged 36 hour fast. So kind of mimicking the typical alternate day fasting cycle. And what we found was that in these people, 36 hours of fasting was able to like really functionally enhance their plasma. So their plasma, um, when we exposed them to, you know, human, um, human cells, ex vivo as kind of like, you know, a, a model for their homeostasis in the actual body. Um, the plasma was able to affect these cells and induce anti-inflammatory effects, induce protective antioxidant effects, and then also produce um, these cardioprotective effects, increasing plasma cholesterol efluxibility, which is like the gold standard marker for cardiovascular disease risk. And that's really profound. So again, to be able to functionally enhance young, healthy people in such a sensitive time frame, we were really fascinated by that and wanted to figure out what's the difference between these two states of plasma that could be causing these, um, these beneficial effects. So we did comprehensive metabolomics, looking at you know, over a thousand different metabolites between the baseline state and the fasting state. And what we found was, of course, you know, fasting induces a very profound metabolic shift, right? we found that there are over 300 different, significantly different metabolites between the baseline state and the fasting state. Of course, ketones were in there as well. Um, and it's very like universal, these responses and not subtle at all. Um, and then when we looked at these 300 different metabolites, um, we kind of combed through that list looking for those that had already been known to be bioactive. So some kind of literature results of either having, you know, an anti-inflammatory effect, the lifespan extension effect, um, the ability to do, uh, induce autophagy, something that gave us a clue that like, yes, these might be these beneficial components of the plasma. And then we narrowed that list to around 30 potential targets and actually took those targets and then screened them on our own in vitro analysis to see if they could mimic these beneficial effects um, on their own in isolation. And eventually what we found was that there were four of these metabolites um, that were the most potent that could replicate all of the beneficial effects that we were seeing from our analyses. And when we combine them together could actually synergistically enhance each other's functionalities. Um, and that is basically what became the basis for our first product, which is the fasting mimetic. Um, and what we like, uh, what we did there, we found that it was it was working in vitro. Um, the FDA considers all metabolites to be dietary ingredients, which is great, perfect for a supplement. Um, so we knew that it worked in vitro, but really wanted to see that it also worked in actual humans. Um, so over the past couple of months, since we've been um, in the Indie Bio Accelerator, we were able to perform a small N of five clinical study basically looking at the effects of supplementation with these four fasting metabolites. Um, so what we did for this was we actually had five people come in and eat a standardized breakfast on its own. Um, and then we looked at their plasma functional metrics like we were talking about about before, or we had those same five people come back in after a washout period, um, eat that same standardized breakfast, but just with supplementation with the fasting emetic and assess their plasma functionalities again. And what we found, we can go to the next slide, Tom, was basically that when the uh, participants ate the standardized breakfast on their own, they had this loss of plasma functionality. And that's really typical, especially in the nutrition world. This is called the postprandial response. So as your body is dealing with all of the fuel and food and foreign matter that's coming into your body, it kind of triggers these pro-inflammatory responses. So that's what we see is that Without supplementation with FMO1, you get this decrease in anti-inflammatory ability of the plasma. You don't really get a change in antioxidant ability. And then you also get a reduction in plasma cholesterol efflux ability. Um, but eating that same standardized meal just with supplementation with the fasting medic was able to not only prevent that loss of function, um, but actually add a gain of function as well. That was able to mimic those beneficial effects that we were seeing um, in actual 36 hour fasting. And then we can go to the next slide too, Tom. Um, so that was really great. We kind of confirmed that this had an acute effect in humans that could mimic these beneficial effects of fasting and prevent those negative effects of eating. <coughs> Um, but we also wanted to figure out, okay, if people take this in the long term, like, you know, are there going to be any potential negative side effects? What are the holistic, you know, um, benefits to taking this supplement? 
Um, so we combined the four um, metabolites together and ran a C. elegans study. Um, in this study, there were 100 worms in each group. The control group was just, you know, under normal feeding conditions, no supplementation. And then these, you know, the fasting mimetic group was also under normal feeding conditions, but also with lifelong supplementation with the fasting mimetic combination. And what we found was that we could increase the median lifespan of these worms by 96%, even when they were normally eating, which is a really great lifespan extension in this model. Um, and then when you actually take that and compare it back to literature results of the lifespan extension effects you can get from actual fasting, you can see that they're like, not only comparable, but the fasting medic supplementation actually gives you a greater lifespan extension than fasting on its own. So really good validation that we're capturing a lot of these beneficial lifespan extension effects um, with these for uniquely upregulated fasting metabolites. So that's kind of like, you know, where we are. Um, we are taking these supplements that are like, you know, commercially available on the market already, putting them together and giving them to the consumer so that they can, you know, basically get the benefits of fasting without necessarily having to fast um, or use it as an adjunct to the fasting that they're already doing. Since this is, you know, meant to mimic a 36 hour fast or at least some of the components of a 36 hour fast. Many people do fasting right now as kind of like the 16-8 style. So they're not really maximizing the benefits of their fast because they're not depleting their glycogen stores. They're not switching over to full fasting metabolism. So we really think that we can help people kind of get these maximum cellular health benefits of fasting through this adjunct supplementation. Super interesting. Wondering what your thoughts are. So it seems like, you know, stripe or slight cellular stress, um, you know, has these, this cascade of potentially beneficial uh, metabolites. You know, uh, one thing that comes to mind is I've, you know, read a lot about, you know, cold exposure and heat exposure. It'd be interesting to, to compare plasma levels um, that you're seeing here with other types of stress inducing uh, activities. Is that, is that something that's on your roadmap or are you, yeah. you going to stick with, uh, stick with the past? I think that I think that like the whole biomimicry aspect is definitely where it's at. Um, I think that being able to look at any state of the body as it changes around and adapts to its environment is really, really cool because then once you, you know, decode that roadmap, right, and recreate it, you can kind of get these, you know, similar effects, right? If you think of the body as a computer, right? And all of the, you know, metabolites, molecules that are floating around in us is like chemical code, right? You know, hypothetically, if you can recreate that code, you can recreate the these bio programs for what your body is doing and like shift it in ways where you want it to go towards more of these health and regenerations towards more, you know, stress resistance, like cold, cold response, these hormetic effects, right? So I think that that's super cool. I think that I would love to like be able to study every single like helpful regenerative state of the body, you know, exercise or figuring out how you can replicate, um, you know, the holistic satire program so that you can help people, you know, actually do fasting more easier so they can naturally get the benefits, you know, without the, the additional weight of hunger. Sure. Awesome. Well, question for both of you. Um, just curious, kind of what's next from a research point of view? Um, obviously, Chris, you're, you're going, going to market soon, but just strictly from a research point of view, both, both Chris and Brianna, curious to get your thoughts on um, how to optimize next steps, what you think this field may look like in 18, 24 months, and, and what's, what's kind of just beyond the horizon for your research? Yeah, sure. I mean, I can go first if that's okay with Brianna. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, so for, for innate biology, like our, our plan moving forward is basically to, you know, we have this great N of five study. That's kind of our pilot proof of concept. Um, we're going to be going into a larger scale clinical study to, you know, further vet it out um, and vet out the capabilities of the actual mimetic itself. And then um, beyond that, we still have that great robust data set of these over 300 um, significantly different fasting metabolites that we can continue to comb through to find novel targets um, for like new products, new pathways, new indications, um, and then like really start cranking out the hits, as they say. 
Um, so that's kind of what innate biology will be doing with its science in the future. And then, you know, continuing on to, again, like kind of try and pioneer this new wave of biomimicry and this new wave of these clinically derived longevity and health span molecules. Great. So I think for me, and this answers one of the questions that was in the chat, um, we really need to define the PKPD or the relationship between the level of ketones in the blood and the effects that we're interested in, because um, really at the moment we, we don't know how high ketones have to be to have an effect. This kind of has uh, relevance for, for fasting and the ketogenic diet and really, really anyone who's looking to use ketones, whether it's from a supplement uh, or if it's through like a lifestyle nutrition intervention. Um, historically in the literature, people have said that um, ketosis is anything over 0.5 millimoles of DHV, but we're starting to see this really interesting class of st uh, drugs called SGL2 inhibitors, which uh, induce a very, very mild ketosis that doesn't go over that threshold, but patients who are on those drugs see improvements in cardiovascular risk. And so it's possible that these signaling effects of ketones occur at much lower levels than was thought previously. So I think that for me, one of the big questions that in the near term that we'll try and address is understanding uh, the, the relationship between circulating ketone levels and, and the physiological response. Terrific. Well, we have about two minutes left. Um, looks like a, a question came in from Alexandra Borioso. Um, they ask if someone were to do a 36 hour fast, how often should they do it? <laughs> That's a fun question. Um, so when I first got into fasting, I was doing alternate day fasting because that's, you know, where all the literature results are, right? If you're looking at lifespan extension in mice, it's always a alternate day fasting regimen. So I actually did that for two years straight, um, felt great, didn't really have any, you know, like problems with it from a physiological perspective, but it can be a bit mentally draining and there's this element of social isolation that goes along with it. Um, so just from my own personal experience, you can do alternate day fasting seemingly indefinitely, but it might become, you know, like a mental drag. Um, obviously, anytime you're doing fasting, especially in the long term, the most important thing is to make sure that on your eating days, especially in an alternate day fasting context, you are getting the maximum amount of like micronutrients and macronutrients that you can um, to make sure that you're not running into any kind of like weird deficiency as you progress through. So that would be my advice, but hypothetically, you can do it indefinitely. Great, thank you for the question, Alexandra. Well, if there are no further questions, um, I wanna thank our panel, Dr. Rhodes, Dr. Stubbs, and uh, Dr. Pearls um, for joining us uh, this morning. Really appreciate your time and uh, your expertise. Um, we, for the, for the audience, we host these once a month. We'll be diving into a topic and more on the food and agriculture side uh, in October that David Yoakum will be leading. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential for more uh, research, more deep dives uh, in this particular um, area here. As I mentioned, a lot going on in terms of the clinical side and the clinical development. Um, we could spend any number of deep dives going into one of those. Um, so keep an eye out for more content related to longevity and aging. And uh, in the meantime, uh, also keep an eye out for the uh, webinar David Yoakum will be hosting next month. So thank you all again for joining and we will see you soon. Great. Thanks, Tom.